Yesterday, in part one, the Sunday Times Insight team, Jonathan Calvert, Hello. and George Arbuthnot, Good to see you. explained how they found themselves challenging the prevailing wisdom about how the pandemic began. The hotspot in the first few weeks of the outbreak was right next to the laboratories in Wuhan and not next to the market. When we started looking at it, the actual evidence for a natural origin was surprisingly weak. It seemed to us that the weight of the circumstantial evidence strongly pointed to the lab. And how research at the Wuhan Institute in the run-up to the pandemic seems to have taken a risky turn. Exactly the steps that were needed to be taken to create COVID-19 in a lab were being carried out. They were doing a type of experiment where they were fusing together viruses and they did not know what was going to happen. They were creating something in their lab which was in effect a monster. But according to the Insight team's reporting, that might not have been the only work going on at the Wuhan Institute. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, the second episode in our two-part special on the origins of COVID. Part two, a shadow project at the Wuhan lab. Part one, we heard how controversial gain-of-function techniques developed by American professor Ralph Barrick were used at the Wuhan Institute. According to the Sunday Times investigation, the Wuhan lab fused together different viruses to see how they might become more deadly in the future. Opponents of this type of work described it as by far the most reckless and dangerous research on coronaviruses, or indeed any viruses, ever undertaken. The research in Wuhan was backed by American taxpayers' money, from grants given to a charity called the EcoHealth Alliance, run by a British researcher, Peter Daszak. And it was led in Wuhan by Dr. Shi Zhengli, the researcher known as Batwoman. But US investigators interviewed extensively by the Insight team, say there was also a parallel, secret program of research. We spoke to um, the investigators in the US who were concerned about the work they alleged the Wuhan Institute was doing on something we might call the Moyang viruses. This all goes back to 2012 when an incident happened in a mine shaft in Moyang, southern China. It was our first big scoop on the origins of the virus back in 2020. But what happened was that in 2012, the Wuhan Institute's researchers investigated an abandoned copper mine with a large bat colony. Six men had been clearing out bat guano there and were struck down by a mystery illness that caused fever, coughs, pneumonia, all the symptoms that you know, kind of were very familiar from COVID-19. And all six men required hospital treatment and three died. Tests on the men for various illness came back negative, but they did taste positive for antibodies to an unknown coronavirus. This was always kept secret, but we were able to piece this all together from a PhD paper written by a student of the director of the Chinese Center of Disease Control and Prevention. So the incident happened while the Institute was working with EcoHealth on something called the PREDICT program. They were given money by the Americans to try and find places where viruses might come out of animals and cross over to humans. Hmm. But none of this was ever reported back to the Americans at all. It was all kept secret, which is extraordinary, really, because it was exactly the thing that they were looking for. I mean, years later, we would be told there wasn't much interest in the viruses in this mine. But actually, Shi Zhen Li and her team from the uh, Wuhan Institute 
took a strong interest in it. They spent four years stripping the Moyer mine and collected 1,300 samples from bats. And they discovered 293 uh, coronaviruses. And that work appears to have ended in May 2015. And a year later, she published a scientific paper and she'd found a coronavirus which she'd never seen before called BTCOV slash 4991. But in that paper, she doesn't mention the deaths of the miners. It just says that they were found in this particular mine. And um, BT Cov 4991 would take on a huge significance because it would later be found to be the closest known relative to COVID-19. And it was there wow. in their lab at the time that the, the pandemic struck. What we've also discovered since that piece in 2020 was that not only was the 4991 virus found in, in the Mojiang mine, but in 2015, the Wuhan Institute also found eight other viruses that were closely related. And so there, there were nine of them from that mine. And prior to the pandemic, we now know those to be the only known coronaviruses in the world that were from the same lineage or family as COVID-19. And they were all taken back to the Wuhan Institute between 2013 and 2015. Shi Zheng Li, Batwoman, has, has claimed, um, and also Peter Daszak, that there wasn't much interest in these closely known matches to COVID-19 prior to the pandemic, and little work was done on them. Now, what the US investigators claim is that, in fact, they were being experimented on, fusing together or mixing together the genes of different coronaviruses and seeing how infectious they were with humanized mice, etc. That's the crucial bit of new evidence. And that, US investigators believe, is how COVID-19 came to be created in the Wuhan lab. And, and do we know why these experiments were being kept secret? Why, why the Americans didn't know they were happening? So what the US investigators allege is that they were being funded by the Chinese military. Now, there is no doubt that the Wuhan Institute was working alongside the People's Liberation Army from, wow. from 2016 up to the point of the pandemic. In fact, we found the published research papers which show some of their joint projects, which involves them experimenting with deadly coronaviruses in the lead up to the pandemic. They've been collaborating. That's what the papers show. They, they show coronavirus research. They do, exactly. And there's actually a number, a number of papers which show this. And they, they date right through from 2015 through to 2019 and show that some of the military's most renowned scientists were working with she and her team. And do we know why? Well, there's a book published in 2015 by the Military Academy Scientists, which openly um, discusses how SARS viruses represent a quotes, new era of genetic weapons that can be, uh, quotes, artificially manipulated into emerging human disease virus, then weaponized and unleashed. Wow. The authors are all People's Liberation Army researchers. And one of the book's editors has collaborated on 12 scientific papers with scientists at the Wuhan Institute. So are we talking about bioweapons? Well, it's possible. The reason that they were working on, on these mind viruses was because they were taking an interest in this whole subject of whether coronaviruses could be used as a bioweapon, or maybe looking wow. at ways in which they might defend themselves from a bioweapon. So certainly the US investigators say that their view is that the Chinese military were conducting this research with COVID-19's closest matches with a view to an offensive bioweapons program. And when you say offensive bioweapons program, I mean, like, how exactly would that work? How would you unleash it on the world and make sure you didn't damage your own population? So the US investigators say that the key is to find a coronavirus that the rest of the world doesn't know about, that is deadly to humans. Now, they point out that the Mojiang mine viruses, 
because that was kept secret. The world did not have access to it. And so what the People's Liberation Army may have been doing is that they were creating in secret a vaccine that could then be used to protect the Chinese population. And then if there was a war, it could then be deployed to affect you know, the rest of the world. That's the theory. In fact, the, the authors of the book argue that such viral weapons can be deployed to bring down an enemy's healthcare system. And they have an advantage over conventional weapons because it's easy to deny any knowledge because they're an invisible killer. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, another, another quote from it says, if one uses a modern genetic weapon, it will be stealthy. No matter if academic evidence is provided or even empirical proof of the virus, there are still 101 ways to deny this, to block and suppress, and leave international organisations and advocates for justice utterly helpless. That's remarkable. But the US investigators were, were very strong on this point, and, and they have actually produced a report which states that despite the Wuhan Institute presenting itself as a civilian institution, the United States has determined that the Wuhan Institute has collaborated on publications and secret projects with China's military. And the Wuhan Institute has engaged in classified research, including laboratory animal experiments, on behalf of the Chinese military since at least 2017. That's remarkable. Do we now have an idea of what was happening in those labs with the Chinese military. I mean, tell us a bit about some of the things you've been looking at, like serial passaging. The US investigators said that they, they believe that the, the mind viruses were being serial passaged, or at least one of the mind viruses was being serial passaged. Now, that's a process in which laboratory animals are infected with viruses and monitored to see which strain is harmful to their health. The most damaging strain is selected for repeat experiments to encourage the pathogens to mutate into something more deadly. The investigators spoke to a a Wuhan Institute insider who Mm. alleged that serial pathogen experiments were being carried out on the nearest relative to the COVID-19 virus. That's so Uh, interesting. So they're passing it through animals, trying to make it a more concentrated, more potent form of the virus. Yes, and so it keeps becoming more infectious or deadly, depending on which you're looking for. And I know that one of the other areas of the virus that you've been particularly interested in is the furin cleavage site. Now, tell us what on earth that means for a start, but also what, why it's relevant. Furin cleavage site is a tiny area of the virus's genetic makeup, which makes it more infectious to humans. Ah. Now... Documents, again obtained under Freedom of Information, show that Dashak, Xi and Barak, as part of their collaboration, had proposed in 2018 to carry out experiments in a pitch they made uh, requesting $40 million of funding from the US Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is called DARPA Mm. for short. And that's responsible for emerging technology for use by the American military. Now, at the time, a furin cleavage site had never been found in the SARS-like coronavirus before, but they were proposing to add this new element to a SARS coronavirus for the first time to see it as, as they expected, whether it would supercharge the virus's ability to infect people. But DARPA turned them down because they said they hadn't properly considered the risks of the work and also hadn't considered the risks that this kind of work could be used for military purposes. And so they turned them down for the money. But US investigators say that their understanding is that the Wuhan Institute went ahead with that work regardless. And what's quite extraordinary is that when COVID-19 emerged in 2019, the following year, it turned out to be the first ever SARS-like coronavirus to contain a furin cleavage site. And that is what made several scientists' eyes pop out of their heads when they first saw COVID-19 and made them believe that it must have come from a laboratory. Because they'd never seen it happen naturally in the wild before. Mm. This had only happened in these labs. And given that we now sort of have a sense of some of the very dangerous experiments that were being done at Wuhan... Just tell us a bit about the labs themselves and 
you know, how secure they are. You know, if the claims are this is a lab leak, I mean, how likely is that? Well, most of this work was carried out at the Institute's Biosafety Level 2, BSL2, laboratories, where they only had light precautions and which were compared to us by a couple of experts as similar to that used in a dental surgery, i.e. you have a mask and... Oh, wow. And, and That's a, it. And, and a white coat, yeah. And in fact, there was a visit to the Wuhan Institute by the American Embassy in January 2018. They, they were kind of scientists stroke diplomats who went in there. And their cables back to the US were leaked to the Washington Post. And they observed that the Wuhan Institute had a serious shortage of appropriately trained technicians and investigators needed to safely operate this high containment laboratory. And so that obviously there's a big risk that if one of the uh, researchers gets infected, one of the new viruses that they created could then escape out into the city through the researcher. In 2020, you know, once the pandemic has spread, there are also questions being raised about just how advanced the Chinese vaccination program is. Tell us a bit about that. Well, the American investigators believe that actually one of the processes that was going on in 2019 was that the Chinese military had taken an interest in developing a vaccine. So, you know, if a country could inoculate its population against its own secret virus, it might have a weapon that would shift the balance of power if they released it into the world. And what we can see is that the People's Liberation Army had its own vaccine specialist, a man called Zhu Yusen, who was a decorated military scientist at the Military Academy. Hmm. He had collaborated with the Wuhan scientists right up until the pandemic. Now, suspicion fell on him after the pandemic because he produced a patent for a COVID vaccine with remarkable speed in February 2020. Uh, little more than a month after the outbreak of the virus. And a report published in April, co-authored by Dr. Robert Kadlec, who was responsible for the uh, United States' vaccine development program, concluded that Zoo's team must have been working on a, on a vaccine no later than November 2019. They think, for his patent to be so advanced that it, he'd have had to have undergone so many different experiments, etc., that there was no way that he could have put the patent forward unless he started then. Now, of course, if that is true, that would suggest that he was working on a vaccine for COVID-19 at the very time it came into being. And um, it would suggest, therefore, well, this is what the US investigators believe, that possibly... COVID-19 was therefore in the lab and he was creating a vaccine for it. Wow. And, and what happened to him, to this researcher from the Chinese military? So in May 2020, at the age of just 54, uh, he appears to have died. Now, we know this because there's a Chinese media report in which his, his death is mentioned very briefly. And there's also a scientific paper about some work he was working on there are brackets next to his name with the word deceased on it. Now, the US investigators say that they've spoken to witnesses who claim that he fell from the roof of the Wuhan Institute. Oh, wow. Now, now we, yeah, I mean, it's, we, we have been unable to verify that. We tried to approach uh, his wife, who is understood to be working as a, um, studying viruses at an American university that she refused to take any questions. So we would stress that should be treated with caution. Yeah. Um, but that is what was alleged. Closed off from the outside world, Wuhan is in lockdown. Flights have been suspended and major roads closed. The authorities are telling residents not to travel anywhere. Mr Speaker, with permission, I'd like to inform the House about the outbreak of a new coronavirus in China. The UK is always well prepared for these types of outbreaks. The US intelligence report says three researchers at a Wuhan lab fell ill and even went to the hospital right before the coronavirus pandemic began. Yet, China reported to the World Health Organization the first patient with COVID symptoms wasn't recorded until nearly a month later. 
For China, when the virus broke out, when the pandemic happened, what did they do to show that they were doing their best to discover where it had begun? Initially, obviously, they looked at the food and fish market in Wuhan. They couldn't find any evidence that it began there. But the main reaction was one of shutting down all the information on where the virus might have leaked from. On New Year's Day 2020, officials in Wuhan ordered laboratories to destroy all their viral samples. And the director of the Wuhan Institute instructed staff that they should not disclose any information about the virus on the orders of the Chinese government. They've closed ranks. Yeah, they've closed ranks. What was the response in the West when the pandemic broke out? This is quite an extraordinary story. And what we can see is that on the 27th of January 2020, Peter Daszak emailed the US department, which had been funding the Wuhan Institute. He wanted to remind them of the fact that they had been funding the Institute because, I mean, they were obviously concerned that it might have come from, from the lab. And in his email, he said that the department's boss, Anthony Fauci, needed to bear in mind this fact when speaking to the media about the spread of COVID-19. Now, the emails then show that a few days later, Fauci received those messages which we discussed earlier from some of the world's leading virologists, expressing concern that the virus appeared to have been engineered. Now, Part of that is is about the the presence of the Führer and cleavage sites in the virus. And I mean, just to give you an example of this, Professor Robert Gary of Tulane University in New Orleans, according to the emails, was astonished by the virus's makeup. He said, open quote, I just can't figure out how this gets accomplished in nature. It's stunning. And then the British scientist Jeremy Farrer, who sat on the SAGE Advisory Committee, in the UK also wrote to Fauci and he said, remains very real possibility of accidental lab passage in animals. Now, Fauci replied to him and queried whether it could have been a serial passage experiment in humanized mice. And Farrer replied, exactly, exclamation mark. Fauci's boss then replied saying, surely that wouldn't be done in a BSL-2 laboratory referring to the Wuhan Institute's low-level biosecurity uh, labs. And Farrow just simply replied, Wild West, dot, dot, dot. Oh, wow. So, which gives you a sense of their, of their kind of private thoughts uh, when they first analysed the virus. And yet that wasn't being said publicly. No. So on the 1st of February, we can see that Fauci then convened a conference call with the scientists And they've since been very kind of cagey about what was said at the conference call. But after that, they kind of changed their tune quite dramatically. So the Dutch virologist, Ron Fouchier, suddenly was beginning to warn on on emails that further debate about the COVID-19 virus being engineered would, open quotes, unnecessarily distract top researchers from their active duties and do unnecessary harm to science in general and science in China in particular. If it was shown to have leaked from a lab, not only would there be condemnation of China and their scientists, but virologists in general who were studying viruses would suddenly be subject to much more red tape, questions about their past experiments. And so there seems to have been the concern across the whole kind of virology community, that this would have a profound impact on, on, on their work going forward. Fauci wrote on his email, like all of us, I do not know how this evolved, but given the concerns of so many people and the threat of further distortions on social media, it's essential that we move quickly. And Jeremy Farrer wrote, critical that responsible, respected scientists and agencies get ahead of the science and the narrative of this and are not reacting to reports which could be very damaging. So then a month later, a joint paper was writ- produced by the group called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2, which is the scientific name for COVID-19. This sort of became the way the world was told to think about the origins of exactly. COVID. Yeah, so they, they suddenly, despite their private thoughts, publicly they were expressing no doubt at all. They said, our analyses clearly show that the pandemic virus is not a laboratory construct or a purposely manipulated virus. 
we do not believe that any type of laboratory-based scenario is plausible. Which, when you read those emails and their private emails, is is an extraordinarily <laughs> bold statement to make. And yeah. you know, people have raised extreme. Yeah, concern. they say, don't they, that that they they change their minds, <laughs> which was an extraordinarily quick change of mind. This proximal origins paper meant that anybody kind of suggesting that there was a lab origin, people assumed was a kind of non-scientific piece of fantasy. And that does seem to have have happened now. You know, it does seem to be the orthodoxy to believe that this was a naturally occurring virus. And a lot of virologists, you know, it has to be said, would read your investigation and and would say it was a conspiracy theory. Why do you think that is? What? Why do you think that they're so convinced by, by the other explanation? Many leading scientists were fearful that their grants would be withdrawn and their freedom to carry out experiments curtailed if the pandemic was thought to have been caused by a lab leak. We spoke to a chap called uh, Professor Nikolai Petrovsky, who's a vaccine specialist from Flinders University in Adelaide, he says that many virologists just feared that they, they might lose funding or be ostracised by the scientific community if they didn't toe the party line. Wow. Um, he says that, in effect, uh, science was corrupted. There was supposed to be a World Health Organisation investigation into all of this. What happened to that? The World Health Organization carried out an investigation in in 2020 through to early 2021. And they appointed to that team um, none other than Peter Daszak, which caused controversy at the time because people could see that he was heavily conflicted. How was that allowed? I mean, when we saw that, we were astonished. Absolutely astonished. I mean, they, they justified it by saying that because he worked with the Wuhan Institute, therefore he knew a lot about, you know, the viruses in China, etc. But to us, it was just extraordinary because it was clear that if it was a natural origin, then this would be a kind of vindication of Dashak's life work. But if it had leaked from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which was a clear possibility, it would destroy his reputation. I mean, China only allowed the WHO to visit Wuhan because uh, the WHO agreed for at least half the investigation team to be made up of Chinese scientists. And also because the WHO allowed China to have a veto over the Western members of the team. The US government did put forward two other specialists, but they were both rejected and instead Dashak was chosen. So when the visit took place to Wuhan with the team in, in January 2021, they did visit the, the Wuhan lab, but it, the visit only lasted a few hours. And Dasha came out and said, well, you know, the mission had, had asked tough questions of his longtime collaborators at the Institute. And at the end of that short trip, they came out with a view that it was extremely unlikely to have escaped from a lab. However... The following summer, in 2021, the lead expert from the World Health Organization who'd led the team was a Danish scientist called Peter Ben Embarak. And he confessed to a documentary film crew that there'd been a backroom deal with the Chinese. They were only allowed to... Yeah, so they were only allowed to mention the lab leak theory, he said, and this is to quote, on the condition we didn't recommend any specific studies to further that hypothesis... This then kind of sent who into panic and the director general was forced to say that all hypotheses remain on the table. It's a complete mess because as a result of all of that, China has now refused entry to any further investigative team. And so nobody is actively investigating the origin of the virus in China itself. We talked yesterday about the declassified information from the American intelligence agencies that has finally appeared over the weekend. You know, we said it was surprisingly short, didn't seem to come to a conclusion. There were some bits in it, though, which do seem to be at odds with with the investigation that you've carried out. So I want to ask you specifically about some of it. 
Firstly, they say, almost all agencies assess that COVID-19 was not genetically engineered. Most agencies assess that it was not laboratory adapted. Some are unable to make a determination. All agencies assess that it was not developed as a biological weapon. Now, that's obviously at odds with, with the work that you've done. What do you make of that? Well, it's quite interesting to say that it wasn't genetically engineered because we know for a, for a fact that they were doing this type of work. And when it says that almost all agencies assess that it wasn't gen- genetically engineered, I guess they um, are not including some of the agencies which do actually believe that there is a high li- likelihood that it could have leaked from a lab. As they note in their report, the Department of Energy and the um, FBI assessed that a laboratory-associated incident was the most likely cause of the first human infection. Um, So they have a conflict of evidence between their expert bodies, which they don't seem to resolve. And if anything, they adopt a tone which is playing down the lab leak. It is quite startling to think when they say almost all agencies assess it's not genetically engineered. That doesn't include the FBI. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And I don't know I don't know why they've sought to phrase it in that way. That's mm. the question. One of the other bits that does seem to go against your investigation is where they say Wuhan Institute personnel have worked with scientists associated with the People's Liberation Army. Some of the research conducted included work with several viruses, including coronaviruses, but no known viruses that could plausibly have been one of the causes of of COVID. What do you make of that? Because again, that that goes against the investigation that you've carried out. Yeah, well, it's worth saying the report is actually striking in, in the fact that it confirms that the People's Liberation Army was working with the Wuhan Institute. Shi Zheng Li, that woman, has previously denied that the Chinese military had, had any connection oh, really? to the lab. So it's actually a very striking confirmation, this. What's the general reaction been to that report, the declassification of all these documents? I mean, not many, from four pages worth. Yeah, well, in, in, in general, it was disappointment. What was, the, what was the most striking response, actually, was that a senior member of the team that our sources were part of which was the US State Department's investigation team, he broke ranks. He was so disappointed in this report. And in the last few days, he's tweeted a protest about it. Uh, His name is David Asher, and he actually led the US State Department's investigation team. Wow, it's very unusual for an intelligence officer to do that. Absolutely. And so he tweeted, a lot is missing from the supposed declassification that we identified in our State Department investigation Other critical information is deliberately distorted or downplayed in a manner that reeks of cover-up. Now, that's an extraordinary statement. And so Asher is suggesting that the US administration is concerned about being implicated in funding a lab which may have created COVID. And that has led to this kind of, led to this very dismissive um, tone in, in this report. I mean, the danger with this is that this is when it starts to sound like it's teetering on conspiracy theory. Is that one of the problems of investigating this subject? It's become so political. Part of the problem was that, obviously, Donald Trump's response to COVID-19 was you know, highly questionable. And he was making statements about how people should protect themselves from the virus that was kind of you know, cl- clearly wrong. And Anthony Fauci at the time, who was the kind of scientific spokesman for the US government, was kind of contradicting them at times, and he was a kind of voice of reason. And therefore, it it seemed logical to believe what Anthony Fauci was saying about the origins of the virus, rather than Donald Trump. But what nobody had appreciated at the time was that on that particular issue, Anthony Fauci was completely conflicted, because he'd been funding the Wuhan Institute, and therefore it was not in his interests to even entertain the lab leak theory. I mean, you know, it, it, it can be very compellingly argued that it is highly likely that the, that US funding did lead or contribute to the cause of the pandemic. I mean, that's certainly what Professor Ebright argues. So if 
one day your investigation is proved to be right, what would the repercussions be? I mean, what would it mean for China? People have talked about reparations for causing the virus. I think it's highly unlikely that such an event would ever take place. I think there's more about preventing such an accident, if indeed it is an accident, taking place again in the future. Because laboratories all over the world can copy these types of experiments. Who knows what safety measures would be in place? And who knows whether rogue nation states might decide to use them in bioweapons or, or whatever. And so the importance of it is that if it did leak for a lab, then I think there needs to be a much tougher regulation on these type of experiments. The Insight team put the findings of their investigation to all of the key players involved. Dr. Shi Zhengli said the Wuhan Institute did not have the virus that causes COVID-19 in its lab, and therefore it couldn't possibly have leaked. Peter Dajak denied the eco-health-related experiments were dangerous. He said the NIH didn't view the experiments as gain of function and that laboratory safety rules in China were followed at all times. The NIH said it has never approved any research that would make a coronavirus more dangerous to humans. And Ralph Barrick didn't respond to requests for comment. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guests, The Sunday Times Insight Editor, Jonathan Calvert, and Deputy Editor, George Arbuthnot. Jonathan and George's book, Failures of State, The Inside Story of Britain's Battle with Coronavirus, is available from all good bookshops. The producer today was James Shield, the executive producer is Kate Ford, and sound design was by David Crackles. If you can, please do leave us a review. It helps others to find us. Thanks for listening. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs>